Hello, my name is Dr. April Besaw. I'm an archaeology professor here at Vassar College, and I'm going to talk to you today about a course that is not open to freshmen, but is a course that will help you understand that archaeology isn't necessarily what you think it is based on TV shows, movies, media, and the newspaper. I'm going to start with this book, which I'm going to use in my Anthropology 332 Ruins and Haunting History course, and it was given to me by a former student um, because ghosts and ghost hunting is something that I talk about a lot in my courses. And you can see that this book is has ghost stories of places like Vassar College, and I've produced two uh, ghost walking tours of Vassar College. But you could also see here that chapter 11 is Statsburg, the point, Hoyt Mansion. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm actually going to take you on a field trip to the Hoyt Mansion at Statsburg State Historic Park. We are at Statsburg State Historic Site. Here's our kiosk that has some information which points out that Statsburg, which you've probably never heard of, is an elegant example of the great estates built by finan America's financial and industrial leaders during the Gilded Age. Why we've come here today is that this extensive trail system includes the Statsburg State Historic Site and Mills Mansion that you can tour and is well preserved. But if you look over here, on the trails there are other buildings which are less preserved and therefore have a very different story to tell. We're starting out on Gardner's House Lane, which includes a sign that encourages you to go to the mansion that is closed for the coronavirus pandemic. And then there's this road that is part of the Blue Trail that will take us to those other buildings that aren't the preserved museum. As you can see, the trail brings us first to the Hudson River, which is right there, which is part of the reason why these buildings are where they are, the Hudson River being more of the highway than the, today's highways are. Um, back in the 1850s when the house we're going to was constructed. Here's the proper front, the river facing of Mills Mansion. And from that spot, if you turn 180 degrees, you could see where we are in the river with this little lagoon here so that it advertised, that the position of the house advertised to people passing on the river who lived here and how rich and prosperous they were. Further down on the Blue Trail, we've come to a intersection that includes the first of the neighbors of the mills for their big fancy mansion. So this one, is not in the state of ruination. It looks like there's lots of activity going on. But we can see that it is very, very different in size, materials, and ostentatiousness from Mill's Mansion. We're going to keep going on the trail, and we're going to go see some other examples of the architecture that is around Mill's Mansion. Just on the other side of this neighbor house on the trail, we have some archaeological evidence of some pre-existing architecture. You can see the right angle and another right angle. This is probably part of a gate, if not part of a very small structure foundation, but 
here if we look on the other side, we see another similar one. So if we line those up there and there, we could tell that the road used to be more centered here instead of centered there. And this was an official gate from this building going down to the Hudson River. So we're just off of the lagoon here and we have a white trail spur that's taking us to this interesting ruin. You could see as we approach that the top window is broken, which is usually a sign the building is no longer in use. But it looks like it's in relatively good condition for a ruin. So maybe not in disuse for all that long. A closer look here, you could see the broken window. If you could also focus in on that corner to the right, you could see that this smaller tree has actually grown through the corner of the roof, which if you could figure out the age of that tree, you could kind of figure out the age of when people stopped caring for this building. And you could also see to the right is a worse off, much more ruined structure. It's got a snow fence around it to try to keep people away. And we will not trespass at this point. We don't have permission, um, but you can see that it has a chimney that has some burn residue. It's a very small building. So this might have been the incinerator, in other words, a trash pickup garbage disposal of the time, but definitely a cool room. Here's a closer look at that small tree growing through the roof structure here of the building, the larger building that had no window back there. Now that we've come to the other side, we could see that it's very clearly a barn barn structure. We'll go around the other side as much as we can. Let's see there's a significant drop off there and there's wood with nails sticking in that's hidden in the grass. So not a good idea to go much further. We can also follow this trail to get a closer look at the chimney structure with the snow fence around it. So all that wood is the roof having caved in and you can see that the bricks are brick color on the top side and the inside, but a different color on the outside, suggesting that there was some attempt to make this building look different than just a brick structure, maybe to make it look pretty or formal. Here's the back side with the big chimney stack entryway. And then coming back around. Oh, this is interesting. You see all that metal there? That clearly was a greenhouse. So glass held up by that metal. So maybe a much more functional building than just an incinerator. And then you could see that we're not far away from another building, leaving those outbuildings behind. We're back on the blue trail now. The lagoon is just there, so that's the Hudson River. And here is the building most closely associated with those ruined structures we were just looking at. We came further up the blue trail. We can now see that this is two buildings, clearly a garage and another formal carriage house looking building, relatively decent shape. The trail continues this way.
formal door right there, very, very large. So clearly for a carriage or some sort of equipment to go in and out with the smaller door for people being a later addition. We're going to head back to the trail and see if we could find the residences associated with these we'll build a blue path from the carriage house and the garage. We have another intersection. We could see just through the trees off to the right a roof structure. There's the structure with the collapsed roof that I could see from the trail earlier. But there's no cleared path to it and it might be a spring house which is where water comes in because I could see a pipe coming out of the side which might mean that there's a huge hole in the ground right in front of me. So this is the kind of site that you come back to in the winter and the early spring when all the plants are down so you could see the ground better. But from there, you could see the building that it's associated with. The fence is gonna keep us from getting too close and we never trespass as part of our professional work. But you could see that this house, the Hoyt house, is in a much more ruined state. Looks like two H's stylized on the sides of those upper windows for Hoyt. That's a pretty fancy and expensive little add-on there. You can see these aren't the front doors. Again, this is the Hudson River's behind this house. So we're not at the point where you're supposed to enter. Back at the road, you could see that there's a little carriage shelter. So that door is accessible for a carriage to be pulled under and people get in and out without having to get wet. You can see it's crumbling. Those two by fours are not really going to hold it up. Signs on the fence that identify this as a project that restoration is planned although progress seems to be limited. You can see the Hudson River right behind it there. And here you can see some interpretive materials posted on the fence, which includes a picture of the formal terraced garden that should be associated with this house. That is probably out there in the woods. So that all those trees are post that picture. And the steps and such, those dividers, are things that archeologists can find in the woods out there to help start recreate that if that's part of the goal of the restoration. Here's a picture of some people looking down from the house and some pictures of the inside showing how ornate the inside of that building is. There's a picture showing that that entryway also had a porch associated with it. So it wasn't just for carriages pulling up at, at the time that that photo was taken and that porch is now completely gone. On the other side of the house now, getting towards the river facing, there probably was a porch coming out around here as well. Otherwise that door would be a precarious drop down to the ground level. And you can see we're coming up on the river and there's a clearing between the house and the river. So the side that I'm about to show you is the side that faces the river the most directly. And therefore this should be the formal fronting. So you can see how the ground is probably landscaped from the original um, so that people passing on ships <clears throat> would look straight up to this house and see this side of the house. So it's hard to tell with that wood there, 
what the original front would have looked like. But you could see that there are more doors on this side and it's very ornate on this side compared to the side that we just looked at, which doesn't front exactly on the river and is less decorative. See just on the roof line there, the decor that focuses on the river. As we're leaving the Hoyt property back on the Blue Trail, we want to take a moment to think about why it is that the Hoyt house is in a ruined state and all their outbuildings are left here to decay and crumble and why it is that Mill's mansion is less so. We've talked a lot about the proximity of the buildings to the Hudson River. The proximity of that Hoyt house to the major roadway, Route 9, which is on our right to the east here, is about two miles. When the Hudson River was the main highway of prestige and commerce, the Hoyts were in a very prestigious place with very prestigious neighbors. But once the river was no longer your main form of transportation, now the Hoyts were in the middle of nowhere. Whereas Mills Mansion is right on the main roads. So even though Mills is much bigger, harder to maintain, it was in a better place for that change from the highways to the highways from the river. I'm back at the information kiosk to take another look at this landscape approach to understanding the ruins at Statsburg State Historic Site. You can see that on the map, which we didn't cross because we stayed on this side, is a railroad track and railroads were just as important as roads as the economics of the area shifted from the river to the major roads like Route 9. So you could see how Mills Mansion has the perfect location for benefiting from the river, benefiting from the railroad, and benefiting from what was the old Route 9 to the new Route 9. The Cove House, which we didn't get very close to, which looked like it was in good condition, was a more modest house, but it was also much more accessible to these other road systems. Whereas the Hoyt House and barn complex that we looked at, it is far away from everything except for the river. And the Hoyt House is older, being built in 1855. So the Hoyt House was unable to restructure itself when the economics shifted from one place to another to another. And they weren't wealthy enough to make that accommodation. There's also all this wetland that would have kept them from building a road more directly from their house to the railroad and to the old post road and then Route 9. So this is a landscape archaeology view where you look at not just one building to learn its stories, but you look at the entire landscape and you look at the remnants of what is left to figure out what story there is to be told. Ruins are created by ruptures. That rupture can be something as small in time as a murder, or that rupture could be a change in how society functioned that made it that what once was prestigious is no longer. You can read more about the Hoyt House and the planned restoration at HudsonValleyMagazine.com. The restoration is talked about in that spooky Hudson Valley book as being about to happen in 2008. So it's still about to happen 12 years later. Maybe the ghosts won't let it happen.